Hi, my name is Jenny Benjamin. I'm the director of the Trulson Marmor Museum of the Eye and the Stanley M. Trulson, MD, Director of Ophthalmic Heritage. It's my pleasure to bring to you the first in our series called Behind the Scenes. It's an occasional series that allows me to share some of the interesting stories and collections here at the museum. So this uh, program on the National Trachoma Service has to come with a little bit of a warning. This lecture is going to feature illustrations and photographs of disease. Uh, while the majority of these are historical in nature, that doesn't necessarily make them any easier to uh, look at. So if you are someone who can't stomach medical images, you might want to reconsider this choice right now. Um, I hope you stay. It's not that bad, I promise. Um, and let's get started. So like a lot of you, I've been working mostly from home since March and waiting out the COVID-19 pandemic. And like a lot of you, I've been reading articles that have looked at the past in order to help us make sense of our present. Many writers compared COVID-19 to the 1918 flu pandemic. And that actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Both were very deadly, very contagious diseases. Um, but I'm a person interested in the history of ophthalmology and actually the COVID-19 pandemic reminded me of a very different disease and that disease is trachoma and that's what we're going to talk about now. So I can kind of hear you from here and you're asking what's trachoma? I've never heard of it. So let me tell you about it and to help is this illustration which is exactly why the warning was provided earlier. Um, trachoma is what some people may call a slow pandemic. It's been known to mankind for thousands of years. Um, there have been many notable outbreaks leading to pandemic, especially in the 1700s during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it's caused by the bacterium Chlamydia trachomitis, and it spreads through personal contact, hands, clothes, bedding, and also passive carriers, especially flies. Critical to its elimination is access to clean water, sanitation, and hygienic practices. Today, trachoma is practically unknown in the United States, but it is still hyperendemic. That is, it occurs at a persistently high level in 44 countries worldwide. It's estimated that 1.9 million people are blind or visually impaired around the world due to trachoma. The World Health Organization has targeted the disease for global eradication, and they're hopeful to get it under control everywhere. So that's trachoma. Why did our current COVID-19 situation remind me of this disease? Because let's be clear, it's not because they behave the same way, right? Trachoma is not fatal, it's not a virus, but how the United States reacted to trachoma over 100 years ago it's pretty similar to how they're reacting to COVID-19 today, and that's what we're going to explore. So let's start with one of the first reactions um, that the U.S. had, which was to close and monitor the border. On April 1st, 2020, the Pew Research Center reported that 91% of the world's population, uh, that's just over 7 billion people, lived in a country with complete or partial border closures. In the US, we've actually been discussing this tactic for a long time. The first monitoring of the border was done by the Marine Hospital Service, which was established in 1798 by President John Adams. The service had hospitals and provided health care to sailors so that the US didn't import an epidemic along with trade goods. It was actually modeled on a similar program in England. In the 1870s, the Marine Hospital Service established the role of the uh, Surgeon General. That should sound familiar. That position is still with us. Uh, and it is given a uh, broader responsibility for controlling infectious diseases in our cities, uh, especially uh, quarantine and treating the sick. Then in 1889, it's renamed the Public Health Service and becomes a commission corps of officers like Army, Navy, and Coast Guard. All of this background uh, is very important to the history of trachoma. So where these histories overlap is here. In 1891, the US government passed the Immigration Act. 
This centralized immigration oversight to the federal government, not individual states, and established immigration stations along land borders and at ports. Most famously, it established Ellis Island uh, and here in the San Francisco Bay Area, Angel Island. The Immigration Act listed people that the U.S. did not want to become citizens. Among those were, quote, persons likely to become a public charge and, quote, persons suffering from a loathsome or dangerous contagious disease. I just love that term, loathsome, and certainly trachoma uh, was loathsome. So actually, it's no surprise that six years after the Immigration Act, trachoma was named the first contagious disease that required screening, and the U.S. Public Health Service jumps into action. It provides officers to screen newly arrived immigrants. Uh, this photograph in this slide is from Angel Island, uh, and you can see in the far left a physician looking at the eyes of one immigrant. He is everting or turning out the eyelids uh, to check for signs of trachoma on the inside of the lids. And at this point, you may be saying to yourself, uh, again, why trachoma? I mean, because it doesn't seem like it's such a big deal. Didn't you say the last major pandemic was during the Napoleonic Wars? Uh, yeah, well, again, trachoma was actually a recognized global problem at the time. The last pandemic was during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it affected Europe and the Middle East. And after those wars, Britain actually established 52 eye or eye and ear hospitals in order to help deal with trachoma. And similar institutions had been established all over Europe and Australia. So in some ways, the US had a lot to worry about in terms of immigration. Um, and we're a little late to the party. So during their work on Ellis Island and elsewhere, the US Public Health Service ended up barring 80,000 immigrants for medical reasons, which included trachoma and low vision. And that may sound like a lot, but actually it was only 1% of immigrants. So really not that many people? While the U.S. government was looking for ways to keep people out of the country, they actually missed something really important. Like COVID-19, trachoma wasn't really a border issue, or if it was, it was a border issue long before they started looking for it. The fact is, is that trachoma was already endemic here in the United States. During the same period that 1% of immigrants are turned away at the border, 8% of Kentucky residents were found to have trachoma. It was found in New York City uh, school children. It was running rampant among Native American populations out on reservations. So just like today, the US government was called upon to react to an epidemic within its borders. And they did it through uh, the building of hospitals, which should sound familiar because we're doing that today, um, except temporary structures, um, and through public education. Does that sound familiar, right? Remember the calls to flatten the curve? Uh, that's similar to how uh, it was all handled back in 1913. So first, President Woodrow Wilson directed that a substantial part of the US Public Health Service budget be earmarked to fight trachoma here at home. So while keeping up their work at immigration stations like Ellis Island, the health service added physicians, nurses, and field hospitals to separate the sick from the healthy. And thanks to the National Archives, we know that between 1913 and 1923, the US Public Health Service established 14 trachoma hospitals around the country. Each hospital had a bed capacity for 25 to 35 patients, and the staff consisted of one doctor and uh, two nurses, um, as you can see in this photograph on the right. And as you can see, many of the hospitals were actually converted homes. They're pictured here. Uh, they were donated these homes by uh, local or state authorities. Uh, one newspaper at the time said that the US Public Health Service took homes that needed some work done in order to demonstrate how to fix up a space to be more hygienic. One room in the hospital uh, was often set aside as a demonstration area, a space where um, patients can come in and look at what clean bedding, individual wash basins and towels would look like so that they could go home and replicate it. 
um, sharing these items, as I mentioned before, does spread trachoma. And it was a major effort on their part to um, create individual wash basins and towels for each member of the family. And the public education didn't end there inside the hospitals. No, the US Public Health Service actually traveled to the surrounding communities. Uh, they created field clinics, diagnosed disease, and tried to convince people to come into the town for uh, the, into the hospital for treatment. Uh, a six page pamphlet entitled Trachoma, Its Nature and Prevention Sounds like a bestseller, right? Uh, that was distributed uh, by some accounts. Over 10,000 copies were given out. Um, yours truly has never seen one, so if somebody else has, I would love to know. Uh, in addition, nurses were expected to instruct locals on basic principles of hygiene and infection control. In 1916, a newspaper article described these frequent meetings being held in churches and schoolhouses using uh, stereo opticon slides. Stereo opticon slides is where the majority of these images I'm sharing with you came from. The museum has a collection of these glass slides uh, donated between 2015 and 2018. Uh, the museum only has one copy of each image in the collection, so we don't have a full set of the stereo opticons. A full set would mean having two slides, right, for each image. That way, when they were projected, they would appear in 3D. Um, I don't know how many slides there would have been in a full set. We don't have a, uh, an original script that the nurses used. So the message is a little lost now. But luckily, many of the photos are labeled, like these two examples here, which feature patients who are inmates of the poorhouse or public wards. Uh, images like these were likely meant to scare people into going in for treatment. The museum slide set also contains pictures of patients undergoing treatment and being cured. So the set was actually part scare tactic and part propaganda, touting the work of the US Public Health Service. Uh, members of the service were often called upon to give talks to medical societies and associations and I'm thinking these slides would have done double duty. The service uh, was really proud of its results. In 1922, they reported half of all cases were absolutely cured. Only 5% lost one or both eyes. Actually not bad considering they didn't know what caused trachoma really um, and they were working without antibiotics. The U.S. Public Health Service continued to treat trachoma until the mid-1930s. Uh, at this point, the hospitals had all been closed, but pop-up clinics were still going strong. And in 1936, the Public Health Service created a 50-minute movie all about um, how it had uh, eradicated certain diseases from inside the United States, and one of the segments was on trachoma and how proud they were of their accomplishments there. And I'm gonna show you that bit now. For many years, the Public Health Service has conducted a campaign against this ancient disease. As early as 1912, Dr. John McMullen of the Public Health Service was sent to Kentucky to make a survey of the situation there. Dr. McMullen, what was found in Kentucky and what was done there? Well, more than 18,000 persons were examined in 1912, and between 7 and 8 percent were found to have trachoma. Much of the work was done in mountain regions, where roads even now are not good. Usually medical officers travel by horseback, and often they had to walk. The work has now been turned over to the states. Instead of painful and sightless eyes to destroy the joys of youth, we now have the precious gift of sight. The future must be drear to one destined to live in darkness. Fortunately, this boy was discovered in time. Instead of blindness added to other infirmities of old age, we have the ability to assume an economic role in family affairs. So this film uh, from 1936 uh, mentions that treatment of trachoma had been largely turned over to the states. And that may also be due not just to the federal government uh, turning its attention elsewhere, but also a medical breakthrough. 
At the 1938 annual meeting of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology, it was announced that a new drug uh, was, had been found that could cure trachoma. It's actually a class of antibiotics that today we call sulfa drugs. With this breakthrough in treatment, uh, a disease that has plagued humans for thousands of years finally had a cure. Uh, and the museum, over 75 years after that, had a curious set of objects that we can share with you. The Museum of the Eye is producing virtual programs like this one every month for the foreseeable future. So I encourage you to check out our website, follow us on social media, and sign up for our newsletter to check out the interesting topics coming up. With that, I want to end the formal portion of this lecture and thank some people who were incredibly helpful, uh, including Stephanie Stewart Bailey and Wade Kennedy. I also want to give a shout out to the US Public Health Service, the National Library of Medicine, and the National Archives, um, whose online collections are, were incredibly helpful in creating the lecture. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the lecture. It was pre-recorded a few weeks ago. Um, today, as you can see, I'm in my office and Stephanie Stewart Bailey is here to help um, read any questions you might want to leave in the Q&A and um, help me stay on track and not babble too much because it's one of the things I do. Um, one thing before we really get started with questions is I need to set the record straight and a little bit of a correction. Um, since we recorded um, the lecture, I found out that I was misunderstanding the word stereo opticon. So stereo is a word today that we understand to mean two images at the same time and seeing in 3D, but that is not how they meant it back in the 20s and 30s. So this is not a set of slides uh, that would have been um, shown in stereo or 3D. The correct term, I think what the makers of the stereo opticon meant was dual projection. So they, you, they could project two images side by side. So with that caveat out, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, you know, 20 minutes are read in already and I'm already, you know, correcting myself. History's a journey. <laughs> I think that's the, the main point of your job is to be able to research these curious objects and find out new qualities about them. Speaking of which, um, I have been curious about the actual size of the slides. Could you maybe show some of them since you're in the office today? Absolutely. Putting on my white gloves, right? That's the beauty of being in the office. Um, the slides are terrific. They're, they're much, much bigger. I'm going to try to direct some down and maybe put a background on it so you can see it. The slides are about um, three by five, a little smaller. Um, and as you can see, they are wrapped in a uh, black tape. Um, that's an adhesive tape, which unfortunately uh, over time, of course, is failing because adhesive being adhesive. Um, and uh, the slides have uh, two glass plates and the photograph is sandwiched in between. Um, they also happen to be uh, labeled with the manufacturer who was a um, uh, Pierre Fultz in Washington, D.C. He was um, known as someone who made slides for um, uh, universities and hospitals. And uh, glass slides like these, um, before this collection, the only ones I had ever seen were um, reproductions of books that were used in academic settings. Super curious. So a couple comments are coming in the chat box. Um, okay. uh, Carol says, I remember in my family lore that one of my grandmother's siblings was turned away from Ellis Island due to trachoma. Yeah. And it was a source of tragedy in the family. So this is very close to home for her. Yes, that is correct. Uh, Getting turned away for a disease at any of the immigration stations um, caused many families to have to reconsider what to do. It was also really tricky in that a lot of um, uh, sailboats, a, a lot of carriers, what brought the immigrants in did not want to take people back. 
right? They um, were actually having a hard time leaving the states. They were, some were stuck in limbo um, because uh, it was considered such a contagious disease. Another couple of questions that are coming in are about sulfa drugs. So, um, do my best. Yeah, uh, and um, so one one question about the sulfa uh, sulfa treatment is um, is sulfa based treatments the only ones we have today? What if someone is allergic to sulfa medications? What uh, would be an alternative? Right. So sulfa the sulfa, sulfa drugs is a class of antibiotics. Um, and it was quickly followed after their um, distribution in uh, the 30s by penicillin. And today we have lots of antibiotic um, that I'm not even go to because I'm not a doctor, but there are many, many options. Um, I think one of the tragedies of trachoma is just how very treatable it is. It is a bacterial infection. So a round of general antibiotics um, is, really a cure if it could be distributed. I see um, another question kind of related, but what other treatments were available um, if it wasn't antibiotics? And um, what they did actually is pretty scary. I mean, you're, you're very lucky I did not um, provide any images of this. Um, there were medical and surgical treatments. Um, and I'm not a doctor, so I'm, I'm going straight from the 1920 American Encyclopedia of Ophthalmology on this. Um, the medical treatment uh, before antibiotics was washing the eyelids with a mixture of atropine and silver nitrate. Um, sometimes lead acetate or copper, copper sulfate was used. Those applications would have been painted on on the inside of the eyelids and had to have been um, applied continually over long periods of time, right, in order to kill the infection. Um, not, a, um, uh, not a pleasant way to go, although they did have um, anesthesia. Uh, but often um, the complaint was that persons being treated these, with this medical treatment uh, stopped too soon and the infection would come back and cause blindness. So it took a very long time. The other way to treat uh, trachoma was surgical and they would cut um, part of the eyelids or even better, they would express them. Stephanie, if you wanna lean to your side and you can see the illustration there of um, the white, the bodies there. Yeah, nice. Gross. So this is what they would use. This is one of, oh, I get to do my YouTube thing. Look, ooh, is that on camera? <laughs> these are nap roller forceps. And they would use these to essentially clamp onto the lid and excise parts. Not pleasant. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Cleared the room. I've just cleared the room. <laughs> um, someone is asking, does this disease still exist? Yes. Yes, trachoma does exist. And I see in our chats that uh, Dr. Hugh Taylor is with us, who knows better than most how, um, how uh, this disease still exists and is still being fought long and hard. Um, and I would recommend anyone uh, take a look at the World Health Organization's website to learn more about the modern um, fight against trachoma. One other question from um, is where does it mostly occur? I have a feeling like where do the symptoms and the signs usually occur? Oh, uh, well, the, uh, the symptoms of trachoma are, are primarily um, in the eyelids, which of course, um, uh, irritate the sclera and, and the surface of the eye. Uh, in terms of where the epidemic was or uh, the pandemic back in the 1900s, um, it was actually a section of the United States back in 1913 that was understood to be a trachoma belt. Um, and it was the Appalachian Mountains and a huge swath of land uh, throughout the uh, South and uh, Southeast. Um, that was known um, is where the US Public Health Service and these trachoma hospitals were um, basically centered around. We just got another question. Um, 
prior to knowing that trachoma was bacterial based, uh, what was thought to be the cause of the condition? That's a great question. Actually, um, the history of contagious diseases is fascinating. The museum does have an exhibit um, on its website that sort of goes into some of it. Um, the nature of contagion, of course, um, was unknown, but uh, it was thought to have been mixed up with a person's humor, so you were susceptible to it. Um, if you were of a lower class or socioeconomic level, it was thought that perhaps it was endemic to you um, in that socioeconomic level. Um, trachoma, especially around the Napoleonic Wars, earned the moniker of uh, the Egyptian disease, which is terribly unfortunate. It has nothing to do with Egypt, um, but uh, Napoleon did invade Egypt during one of his campaigns and um, a lot of the soldiers there became blind um, due to several types of infections, trachoma being just one, but it did earn that moniker and um, texts throughout the 19th and 20th century refer to it as the Egyptian disease because of that. Super, super curious. Um, so Madeline asked uh, and corrected her question, where does it exist now? Which countries? Well, anywhere that uh, you, you have a lack of uh, sanitation, um, con sanitary conditions, trachoma will pop up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, countries in Africa, um, I believe South America, these I'm not gonna blurt out a bunch of names just in case I'm wrong. <laughs> Again, I would really recommend uh, for the um, for uh, the modern uh, fight to look at the World Health Organization. And there's a link in our website um, to that, their information on uh, how they're fighting trachoma. Great, I think that covers all of the questions that have been put in the box. If anybody else wants to throw one last question in, if not, I think we can wrap it up for today. Great, great. I just wanna thank everyone for coming and listening and asking questions. If, yet, if you're like me and you wake up in the middle of the night and you just have a burning question you didn't get to, um, <laughs> does anybody do that about your coma? I don't know, J maybe just me. Um, anyway, uh, if you do, please send us an email, um, visit the website. Uh, our email is museum at aao.org. We'd be happy to chat with you about this and any other topic related to ophthalmic history. Um, and I hope I'll see you here again next month. We're having a terrific program on uh, Renaissance um, medicine and um, with my friend Rylan Sian, who is um, Northwind Apothecary. It's, it's great. And we're tasting medicines and y'all should come. It's good. <laughs>